And there we go. All right, good evening, everyone. Once again, Ian Andrews joining you uh, from Lakewood Alive. Uh, thanks so much for being here for the latest installment of the Know Your Home series, Electrical 101. Uh, first of all, thanks to our sponsors, uh, City of Lakewood, First Federal Lakewood, Lakewood Public Library, and the good folks over at Cleveland Lumber. We always appreciate their support. Uh, we are thrilled to have you here uh, with our uh, Housing and Internal Operations Director, Allison Urbanic, uh, and uh, our good friend, John Turner, who has probably one of the coolest workshops in, in town. Uh, so you don't need to hear from me anymore. We're gonna go straight over to Allison and John. So uh, guys, go ahead, take it away. Great, thank you so much. And it's, it looks like I'm standing in front of a Zoom background, uh, really, but it's, I, I'm not. I picked the wrong outfit today because it's very busy. But uh, today we are very excited because we are going to be talking about electrical. I don't know about you, but ACDC, I didn't even notice. He pointed at his shirt and I was like, that's a nice shirt, John. And now I Looks, get it. It's stolen. <laughs> So we're in for a real treat tonight. Uh, so Electrical 101 really is going to help us get the basics and understanding of electrical. Exactly. How it leaves the pole from the street, comes into our homes, and then what happens to it and as it gets dispersed through the house. We're going to talk about panels, electrical panels. We're going to talk about outlets. We're going to even get down to the nitty gritty of the wire that runs through our walls and what the three different wires in our wire do for us. Exactly. Uh, and so we're going to take the shock. I've been waiting all day for that. The shock out of electricity. Uh, so we're super excited to be here, but we're sad that we're not in front of you. You know, normally we do these in person. Uh, and so we do, we're going to try to make the best of this. We have our Q&A portion down at the bottom. You all have a Q&A button. Please put your questions in there. Ian will be relaying questions to us uh, throughout the presentation. And then we also have some PowerPoints that will be helpful to us throughout this presentation as well. So please make sure to use that Q&A or chat feature uh, if you have any questions or comments to help us guide this conversation. And uh, we're going to go ahead and get started. All right, John. So again, thank you so much for being here with us, or I guess hosting us here You're at welcome. your workshop. Oh, yeah, it's always a pleasure. It's always a pleasure. And um, so how do we want to get started? Well, I think uh, what, I'm just going to make a general comment uh, in the very beginning, and that is I'm not a licensed electrician. I was in the home repair uh, business for a little over a decade. I've done quite a bit of electrical, um, but just full disclosure, I am not an electrician. This is a 101 course, so we're really going to kind of stay on the surface here, try not to get too far into the weeds. Um, so bear that in mind when you're asking your questions. If you're trying to sh troubleshoot an actual problem and so forth, uh, may not be appropriate. What we're really going to try to accomplish today is to let you get a, a, a kind of a bird's eye view and a general understanding of how electricity comes into your home and how it behaves once it's inside your home, all right? Um, and there's, you know, and again, the t-shirt supposed to be funny, but that is the two different flavors of electricity. It just basically comes in these two flavors. And it's either gonna be AC, which is what we're gonna be talking about today, or DC, which we're mostly not gonna talk about today. And what okay? does AC stand for? So AC stands for alternating current. DC stands for direct current. And we'll get into a little bit of, of what that means, but, the primary difference is that with alternating current, the current, the electricity, is actually moving back and forth in the wires, okay, in and out, all right, almost like a saw, okay, whereas direct current is more like water in your pipes in that it's just going one direction until it comes out someplace, all right? So those are the two primary distinctions. Now, we're going to spend a little time with theory because what I want you to walk away from here tonight is a basic understanding of how to do real basic troubleshooting and also how to map the electricity in your home. Because that, as, you're, as a homeowner, really should be step one in your house is to know how it flows to your house, where it's going once it leaves the uh, uh, breaker panel, okay, or a fuse panel if, you, if you've still got a fuse panel in your house. And again, We'll get into the differences of those. So uh, as Allison pointed out before, and Ian, if you could pull up that uh, slide number two, please. Cool. 
cool. So while he's doing that, so so yeah, go ahead. Yeah, so we are going to start here with the early phases of how electricity comes from the pole into the house. So, right. um, so John's going to talk about those things. Exactly. So we all talk, you know, hear about uh, uh, generation stations or, or or power stations, so forth, uh, that are you know fired either by natural gas, coal, um, nuclear, so forth. The power that's coming out of there is is very high voltage and we're talking hundreds of volts and and maybe i should back up just one more second before we drive down that road there's two flavors of electricity and electricity has two components whether it's ac or dc it always has two components the first component is amperage okay amperage is the amount of electricity it's the volume it's the if you if you're using a plumbing analogy it's the amount of water coming down the pipe okay the, ex the next component is voltage, and the voltage is the amount of push, how much force it has. It's the pressure that's behind your water when you turn the tap on and so forth. The pressure would be the voltage, all right? Now, with AC current, alternating current, where it's going back and forth, the whole plumbing analogy gets a little wonky. Uh, but for our purposes tonight, we're going to make it work. Uh, so just... Bear that in mind as, as we go along. So amps and voltage together, amps times voltage will give you wattage. And I think we're all familiar with that term. You look at a light bulb, you look at your appliances, whether it's a hair dryer, space heater, so forth, it'll usually have a rating called watts. Those two components together, multiplied together, give you the watts. Again, bear that in mind, important a little bit later. So when the power is generated, at the generation station, it's coming out at very high voltage, hundreds of volts, okay? Now, I think we're all pretty familiar that within our houses, you've heard the term 110, 120 volt, so forth. So how do we get it from, say, 600 volts down to what you can use in your house? That's the function of the transformer. And if you look at that slide, you'll see that pointed out there. And that's the thing that you see sitting up on the pole and that's also the thing that usually goes wrong in an electrical storm and leaves you without power, is that they short out, they either get drowned out by water getting inside of them because they're old and busted, um, or some critter gets up there and touches the wrong thing. Bad day for the critter as well, by the way, um, or just plain old age. So, and then, you know, during the storm, they get tossed about or heavy rain and so forth. And if they're weak and ready to go, that's why they blow. It's usually pretty entertaining when they go. You can usually hear it and or see it, especially if one's parked, you know, close proximity to your to your home, All right? So that transformer is taking that 600 some odd volts or, or more and stepping it down. And then as the voltage comes down, the amperage comes up because again, those two have to stay in balance. So 600 volts, you know, I'm not sure how many amps it would be. I'd have to look it up. I've, I've long forgotten. But as that voltage comes down, the amperage comes up. It then comes across from the utility pole to the mast that's mounted to your house. And then you have that funny looking thing where it goes up and under. And that's basically to try to keep the water out. It comes down to the meter. And then from the meter, it comes down and goes into your house where it emerges basically on the backside of your fuse panel and or breaker panel, if you've got a little more modern electric, all right? In residential AC electric, you're gonna have what's called single phase power. Now, some of you may have heard the, the uh, term three phase power banding around, bandied about, and that's more for industrial, like what I might have here in the shop, all right? So if you're running really large equipment, things like that, you might have three phase. For residential, you're going to have single phase. Now, a little bit of a disconnect is that it, technically you actually have two phase, but we don't call it that just to keep you confused, <laughs> right? Um, and it does a pretty good job of that. So, if we could go back to the slides, Ian, um, I think if we could keep that photo up uh, for a little bit longer. Thank you. Okay. So, if you look at that slide, you'll notice that there's three wires coming from the transformer 
to the mast that's on the side of your house, okay? And again, I've just mentioned that it's actually two-phase power, and I'll define the phases here in a second. But basically what you have coming into your house are two hot leads, all right, both at about 110 to 120 volts. And you can use 110 and 120 interchangeably, all right? There's no real difference. That third wire is the neutral. And we're gonna, gonna separate neutral from ground because they are not technically the same thing. Even though they behave the same, they are not technically the same thing. Mm -hmm. right? So the neutral and the two power or hot leads, which in the nomenclature we call legs, one leg, two leg, and the neutral are gonna make their way all the way back to the power plant. All right. So now these wires come down, go through the meter. The meter is basically measuring the flow, the amperage coming through those wires into your service entrance, which is basically the backside of your breaker and or fuse panel. All right. From there, it gets distributed to various breakers or fuses. And from there, it gets distributed through the through the structure of the house to, to run various things. All right. That's great. So again, even though we call it single phase, and I know why we do that, but technically it's actually two phase. And, and if we can pull up uh, slide number eight quickly, uh, just for a second, Ian. Eight. Yep. There we go. One more, I think. Two more. Don't, right there. Okay. Don't be frightened. Okay. <laughs> there's not going to be any math and there's no tests. But again, I mentioned before that with alternating current, that current is going back and forth, positive to negative, positive to negative. And it's doing it, in our case, in the United States, 60 times per second. All right. And that's why you'll see a lot of devices, you look at the data tag on your electrical devices, it'll say 50 to 60 hertz. A hertz is a cycle per second, okay? So this electricity is sitting there going back and forth. We're not gonna get into the whys and wherefores of that because it's a little bit technical, a little bit in the weeds, and we can always come back to it. And also Google is your friend on all of this stuff. You have a question, I didn't cover it properly or, or, or clearly, Please let your fingers do the walking. Ask the Oracle; you'll get. Or you can call things. Lakewood Alive, and we'll or, or, help or, you. Yeah, yeah. Or you could call call <laughs> Alex. You know, I know you're trying to put me out of business and all, yeah, but I that's know, fine. I know. <laughs> so, if you look at this graph, um, you'll notice that so let's take the blue line. All right. So that's called phase one, and we're going to ignore the green, which is phase three, which again gets into to commercial or industrial power. So phase one. You'll see that over time, it comes up and it peaks out at about 120, right? Right where the pointer for phase one is, okay? And if you follow it, you'll see that it comes down, crosses over zero, and comes back down to minus 20. And then comes back up, wash, rinse, repeat. And that's one phase going back and forth. The second line that's coming into your house, the second power line, is going to be the red line. That's phase two. And you'll see that it works in absolutely opposite phase, right? So that way you have two legs of usable electricity coming into your, to your house, into your breaker panel. And now you only need one neutral wire to be attached to that because they're going back and forth. That neutral wire only gets used half the time for each leg. Now, don't worry about hanging on that too hard, but that's how it goes, all right? An analogy that was put to me that made, made sense to me at the time is if you look at old school lumberjacks that used to saw the wood with a, with a saw, you had that old gang saw where you had two lumberjacks, one on each end, going back and forth to saw a log. Single phase is that saw with only one lumberjack going back and forth. And the neutral is just kind of attached to the other end, dangling there, holding it up, but not actually providing any power. The second phase, you attach it, is the second lumberjack, and now they're working in unison, back and forth. Well, now you get double the power. Well, this becomes important 
or usable when you need to operate a really large power hungry device like your air conditioning if you've got central air uh, if you have an electric range or stove that's going to be 220 right 120 times 2 220 sometimes and again we talk about these things as either 110 or 120 so you'll sometimes see that described as either 220 or 240 volts all right but large devices can take advantage of both of those lumberjacks pushing back and forth on that saw to give you, you know, heat uh, primarily. So and dryers, your dryer. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. So and we'll come back to that a little bit more down the road. OK, so those that's the primary thing you need to understand about the power coming to your house is that you've got two power legs and one neutral and that one neutral services both power legs. Okay. So if I can ask a question and it may be out of, out of what we're asking today. Answer. Well, that's, you know, and that's okay. <laughs> so, um, most people have a hundred amp service, correct? Right. Going to their breaker box. Exactly. And a lot of folks are now transitioning to, is it a 200 amp service? Yeah. yeah. Uh, because of all the things that we do in our homes. Exactly. So, uh, Ian, if you could go back to the second slide with the utility pole, please. So the line that's coming into our homes from the pole, mm -hmm. does that need to be changed when you upgrade to a 200 panel, Correct. 200 yeah. amp service? Exactly right. Uh, especially if you're going from old, let's say, you know, if you're really in an older home and it hasn't been touched, you're going to have probably 60 amp service. And so that's common in a knob and tube? Oh, yeah. Probably? Absolutely, yeah. Um, in fact, that's the only way you would find a 60 amp panel is in a knob and tube situation. And again, knob and tube, you've probably heard it, and we're getting to that. So, um, so yes, if you decide you want to upgrade your service, you're going to replace your uh, fuse panel, 60 amp fuse panel, with a breaker box, and you're going to add more circuits because we're all using a lot more electricity today than we ever anticipated when those these older houses were built. The power company will then make the decision. They will come out and look at those lines, those drop lines coming from the transformer to your service entrance and decide whether they need to be upgraded. It's on them. Um, I don't think they've started charging for it. They used to not to. Um, but I think it depends on maybe how big of a step you're going to make. I have not heard of anyone being charged from the electric okay. company at this point. Um, I do, you know, you, it is a permitted job for the city. Mm -hmm. Oh, absolutely. So, and then they come out and make sure it was installed correctly. And then they give it the green sticker to turn it on. But right. I don't believe that there is a charge at this point. Okay. Well, good. There shouldn't be because as you're using more electricity, you're paying for it. So that's how they should reimburse it. They should be happy to do this for free, in my humble opinion. Yeah. <laughs> so like at my house, we are talking about getting an electrical upgrade because every time we use the uh, microwave and the toaster oven, oh, yeah. it blows a fuse, right. which we then have found out that that fuse is also tied to like three other outlets mm -hmm. in our house mm -hmm. that have nothing to do with the kitchen. Right. So um, <laughs> it's usually, oh shit, I forgot to put the microwave on half power so that I could use the toaster oven or vice versa. Exactly. So we're now starting to talk about that, but you know, it makes sense because we're using, you know, there's the TV and there's several computers now, especially working from home. Right. So we're really starting to evaluate if it's time. And then electrical cars coming down the line oh, yeah. being more common Absolutely. and charging at home. I think we are considering kind of upgrading. Yeah. Do, do you know what your service entrance is now? Do you know what your We have a hundred. You have a hundred. And yes. is it breakers or fuses? Uh, we have breakers. You have breakers. Okay. And we'll get into the difference of those because it's significant. Um, so absolutely right. Uh, Upgrades are common, uh, and sometimes they get driven by your insurance company. Uh, insurance companies do not lock like knob and tube wiring. Again, I'll come back to define. So they sometimes, you know, can get a little, uh, little prickly, and yeah. force you into into doing an upgrade. Uh, I can tell you that upgrades are not cheap, especially if they're done properly. 
they are a permitted job, as Allison just mentioned, um, and you want to have a permit pulled and have it inspected. Uh, you also, if you get a hold of an electrician, and electricians come from terrible to wonderful, just like anything else, um, they pull the permit, not you. And if they try to talk you into pulling a permit, stop, say thank you, bye, move on to the next next guy or girl. And it's common for the shady contractors to say, oh, well, a homeowner permit is way less expensive. Mm -hmm. So let's go ahead and have you pull this. I'll do the work. Don't worry. But honestly, it's the person at the end of the day who pulls the permit who's responsible for the work. Exactly right. And with electricity, you don't want to mess around. Mm -hmm. um, the problem with electricity is that by the time you see it, feel it, touch it, it's too late. You've been zapped. Right. Okay? Um, so... Let's see, where are we at now? We're with uh, service entrances, types of panels. Let's probably talk yeah. about circuitry, okay? Here we go. So if you have a little box that might have an array of four to six of something that looks like this, you have fuses, okay? If you have, and I don't know, Allison, if you can point it quickly to, to that panel, I can. I'll even walk over there. Right. See, this is what happens when you go to a nice workshop. <laughs> that is a breaker box. That's a 200 amp. Uh, that's, a, that's a single phase. You can see the service. main yep. right there, 200 amp. Okay. This is what, if you were to upgrade, this is what you would get now. You would not get fuses. Fuses, um, they're grandfathered in. You don't have to get rid of them, but they're one and done. When they blow, you have to unscrew them and replace them. Um, and Again, you've got six circuits trying to service a whole house. If you've got children, um, I can more or less guarantee that you're changing fuses on a, on a fairly regular basis, all right? Breakers, when they trip, and that's what we call it, when a breaker you know, senses that there's too much current going through the line, it'll trip and it'll look like it's off, like this one right here. These, these that are pointed towards the inside are on this one is off, it'll look like that, and you basically just push it back into place, okay? And then if it trips regularly, it could either mean that there's too much on that breaker Correct. or the breaker's bad. Correct. Um, but I just want to point out mm -hmm. how nicely organized <laughs> and labeled this is. The furnace is on this one, the coffee pot, I saw the coffee pot, it was on one. <laughs> well, you got a kitchen. Uh, receptacle and so forth and this so is coffee something pot and microwave and hall light exactly so and this is something i'm going to talk about here in just a few minutes is mapping your electro electrical because you're going to do not only yourself a huge favor but you're also going to do whatever electrician contractor and so forth that may come in and work on it a big favor by mapping out your electrical and i'll show you how to do that it's pretty easy you can actually make it into a game um, oh yeah. that sounds like so. fun <laughs> So, um, so yeah. Okay. So here's the breaker box. You either have again, 60, hundred or 200 amp service. In this service. case we're at a 200 amp, um, uh, service level, which is, I think that's basically the max that you can do for residential powers, 200, 200 amps. And if we could just point out, if you do run into an emergency situation, you know, a fire has started or, um, you know, something is happening in your house and you're, you're leaving it, but I mostly am thinking about fire you would, in a safe manner, this one shuts off the entire electrical exactly. panel for the whole house. This breaker feeds all of these other breakers. So that's an emergency. Something's happening. Someone is unfortunately being, elect I don't know, electrocuted. Well, I mean, or the, the, the reasons I used to, to trip a main, um, if I'm working in somebody's house, is because I don't have a map. And I don't know what that particular circuit is feeding and I'm in their walls, I'm doing something and I'm like, you know, I just don't know. There's enough ambient light out. I'm just going to trip the main, shut the place down, do what I need to do and then fire it back up as opposed to me trying to trace it out, which is time consuming and, you know, billable hours, which of course the homeowner might take exception to. Sure. So the other reason you might use main is if in the case of a power failure. So let's say the power goes out, you know, you've lost a transformer and the power goes down. Well, Best practice is to come in and flip your main, okay? 
because when the power does come back on, it doesn't always come on clean. And by that, I mean one leg will come up and then the other leg might come up or they might come in and out a few times as they're making their repairs. This can play havoc with electronic devices and all, especially uh, devices that have motors in them, electric motors in them. And I'm thinking of dryers, uh, most refrigerators, uh, your air conditioning, so forth, has electric motors. They do not like uneven power, especially if they're on, their, on, a, on a 220 circuit. So that would be a good reason to just shut down the main, let the power come back up. You know, and watch your neighbors, watch the street lights, whatever you got to do to to make sure that it's back up. Then flip your main. That's a great idea because I know a lot of people who have lost refrigerators doing because of that. You know, the the power went out and it came kind of like a brownout stage. It came back kind of half powered. Exactly. Or um, you know, motors in their furnaces have also been blown out. Exactly right. So right. that's yep. a great suggestion. Yep. Okay. Okay. So if we come back over here. How are we doing, Ian? Do we have any questions? Should we take a quick pause for questions? Andrew? Oh. I can't hear you, Ian. Can you hear me now? Oh. can't hear you so we're going to move on um i'm hoping you can hear me okay can you give allison a shout on your on her phone okay oh, so here's a question that we have is where do i buy the white tape you use for mapping the breaker box great question marion yeah um you can uh, wow where do you buy white tape so I would, if I were thinking about that, I would use labels, yeah, like labels, like yeah. uh, letter labels, exactly, exactly. Address, address labels, yep, address and cut labels. them in so half. Staples, you know, the, the you know the office supply stores uh, would be a good good source for that. If you have a label maker, that's fine. Um, but start out with just a handwritten because you will be making changes and, and so forth, and and you'll see why momentarily when we start talking about how to map it all out. Um, so hopefully that answers answers the question. Uh, so any other questions before we move on? Let me see here. I might have I'm one. Back. I'm Allison, can you hear me? I can hear you. Welcome. Great, Hi. Thanks. Uh, I don't know. The airplane flew over. Everything fell apart. Sorry, team. Did did you get to the oh, white sir. tape? We did get to the white tape. I think we might have another question. We do. We've got. Uh, when you're looking to buy a home, what are some electrical red flags to look for when you're uh, touring that home? Uh, good question. I'll tell you one of the main ones that, that uh, you'll get spanked for, and again, we're jumping ahead just slightly, and that is grounded versus ungrounded receptacles. Yes. So in yes. older homes, you typically don't have the grounding circuit, and the grounding circuit is that third prong on a receptacle. This guy right in the middle, the mouth, right? If those are the if those are the eyes. In the mouth, the mouth is a grounding circuit. Old school is just two, right? Now, a lot of your devices today come with the three prongs and people will, for convenience, I understand it, flip from there two and replace all of their receptacles with this, even though they don't have that third grounding wire. Well, any kind of a pre-sale inspector that knows what they're doing is gonna look for that tested and it's very easy to test for they don't even have to pull the plate or anything like that um, and you'll be replacing all your receptacles with this and or upgrading your wiring <laughs> to allow for that grounded receptacle so that's one that's one red flag and this is this is fairly common right and so a simple electrical tester plugged into that outlet will, will tell, tell you, you. Mm -hmm. yep exactly exactly uh some other red flags some other red flags uh, would be if you're in the basement, if it has a basement or a crawl space, um, and a lot of extension cords seem to be running through the basement uh, or the crawl space. And I can just tell you the amazing things I used to find um, as a contractor and, and going into some of these places. Um, what would be another one? 
if you've got multiple, multiple panels. So we showed you that one breaker panel. That should be it in a given home, unless there's a sub panel, that, a little smaller panel that might be up on the third floor because somebody's converted the third floor to an office. All right. And instead of running a bunch of circuits from the basement all the way up, instead they've run a branch circuit called a sub up to that third floor or out to the garage, for instance, and you've got a smaller breaker panel in those locations. But if you're in the basement and you've got a panel that looks like that, plus you've got a panel next to it that's got some fuses in it and then maybe another panel, somebody's been in there screwing around and just adding stuff and not really reconfiguring, just kind of doing add-on. That can become a nightmare, especially when you're trying to upgrade service and or trace down a problem. Uh, so that would be that would be another red flag. Uh, another one would be Federal Pacific Electrical yes. Box. Yes. Um, which are very common in Lakewood homes. Yeah. So they are an older style breaker box. Correct. Um, I, you know, if you talk to certain people, they say, oh, they've been given a bad name. Other people say they're horrible fire traps. Um, they had a problem. They, so they there didn't is, get that reputation out of thin air. So if you have a Federal Pacific box and you're looking to sell, that's probably going to be a strike against you. Yeah. And if you see a home with a Federal Pacific box, it's probably a negotiation tactic for you. Exactly. Exactly right. And, and it's easy to say you know, their logo is a big F and a P with a lightning bolt running through it, which may have been unfortunate later, yeah. <laughs> later on for them. But uh, yeah, so the FP boxes are, are something that, you know, they, they shouldn't be a deal killer. But as Allison said, it could be a negotiation point for you because you're probably going to need to, to upgrade it, whether it's a Federal Pacific box or if you've got if you've got that this in your house, you might as well just start budgeting, saving for an electrical upgrade. Right. And then I would just say one more thing to look for is not only extension cords in the basement, but how many extension cords are being run throughout the rest of the house, yeah. which means either lack of outlets or lack of working outlets or maybe not grounded outlets. Exactly right. Exactly right. And the other, another red flag is again, trying people trying to get around the grounding uh, versus the ungrounded is people will take a three prong receptacle and then take a grounding wire from the grounding contact and run it along the baseboard to something metal. If they've got steam heat or hot water heat and, and wrapping it around or connecting it to those pipes, those water pipes to provide a ground. It works, but it isn't code. And if you go to sell a place, you'll get spanked for it and have to undo it. So that would be another, that would be another red flag to me. Uh, so Ian, is there an, another question? Yeah, just one more. Uh, early on, uh, Marion asked, how do I purchase the brightest bulbs for my lamps? I have visual difficulties and I really like bright light in my home. My home. Any recommendations, John? Yeah, absolutely. LED. LED has kind of, uh, what has it done? It's, 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 brought, it's given us a, a bit of a break, especially if you've got a house that's a little shy on amperage. Um, by replacing all of your incandescent and even fluorescent bulbs can can pull some pull some watts, but the LEDs use a fraction a fraction of the power. And again, coming back to that analogy of water going through a pipe, in an older house, you'll have a little garden hose for your electricity. Okay, and that's what you've got to play with. So if you're trying to run a whole bunch of different spray nozzles with that one garden hose, well, you're, you know, you're going to see the, the, the pressure drop off and you're not going to get the job done. A bunch of incandescent lamps or, well, we'll stick with lamps. A bunch of incandescent lamps are a little bit like those spray nozzles. Okay. And if you've only got that little half inch hose coming in or 60 amp service, you can run into problems. You want more pressure, brighter light, then what you can do is use LED, which use a fraction of the power, so you can bring up the brightness, all right? 
And if you go to, you know, the hardware store uh, or any of the big boxes, so forth, and you look in the light bulb department under in the LED, you'll see that they've got charts to help you make that transition from the old school, you know, incandescent lamp to the LED equivalent. So that's that's one strategy um, that could save you from having, you know, force you into a, to a service entrance upgrade. And there's also new LED bulbs that have a button that will change it from blue light to softer colored lights. Exactly. Uh, so there's a lot of technology through LEDs that not only are you saving energy, you're getting a brighter light and, um, you and know, they're dimmable now too. And dimmable. Yep. So they're very, they're great. Yeah. And their price point is such that it really almost doesn't make any sense anymore uh, to buy an incandescent lamp or even a CFL, which is the fluorescent uh, equivalent. I think that are just probably going to fade away that pun, but. Yeah, um, the LED is is here to stay and and uh, is basically what you need to do. Is that an answer? I think so. I think so. I'm going to set this down for just a second. All right, that's great, John. Yeah, we've got a question that I think you're going to get to, so I'm just going to pose it so you keep it in your mind about improving the old school outlets. When we get to slide four and we start talking more about outlets, maybe we talk about how to improve them, make some changes. All right, make some changes to them or replace them. There's there's, well, there's Probably, probably replace, uh, okay. uh, to use the word improve, but I think replace is probably what we need to be doing. Okay. Um, that, and again, this is electrical 101, so I'd like to stay away from the actual procedure of changing uh, an outlet because that's fraught with a little bit of danger, um, especially if you've got knob and tube. And I look, I don't have any more knob and tube wiring left. Uh, I wish I had. Uh, and kept it. I put one in the workshop for next week for oh, insulation, okay. but I did not and put one in for this one. So, so, so maybe we better talk about knob and tube now. And, and, and just and it's, and it's appropriate to talk about it. So we've talked about the two different types of electricity, uh, two phases coming in, breakers versus uh, uh, fuses. Now the power's got to leave that panel and make its way through the house. Now old school. We used knob and tube, and that basically uh, refers to the two devices that are used to get the wire through wood, in the case of a residential house in Lakewood, or masonry, I guess, uh, if you've got that brick, and that's the tube, all right? So you drill a hole, you put this ceramic tube, and it's just, yeah, it's basically just porcelain. You put that, that ceramic tube through, and then you run the wire through that tube. Now, that porcelain cannot conduct electricity. So that's why it's used. It's used as an insulator, all right? So you run your wire through it, and then the knob is wherever you need to make a turn with that wire. So you come through the joist, and now you gotta hook a Louie and head off the other direction. You'll put a knob in there, also made of porcelain. They started out life as white, whatever color they are in your basement after 100 years, could be anything from white to black. Um, it's wrapped around it, couple of times and then shoots off in the direction that it needs to go. So, hey, Ian, if you could look in the chat, if people have knob and tube, could they raise their hands mm -hmm. through the chat function just to let us know who has knob and tube? Yeah, so far we've got, uh, it was two, now it's three participants. Uh, so at least three of our uh, 15, so a fifth of our, uh, of our attendees have knob and tube. Okay, and of those people who have them, uh, could you put into the chat box if you have a combination of Romex, which is the newer wire, so you probably have two panels maybe, uh, as well as knob and tube. So if you have a hybrid. Right. This is an example of Romex, and it would look something like this. It might have a white uh, outer, outer sheath. Okay. And we'll keep that going. So coming back to knob and tube, and again, when the house was built, uh, you had two, oh, let me back up again. So power is delivered through uh, these wires, two of which are power, one of which is the neutral. The neutral is gonna be white in color. And believe it or not, when your house was built, 
with the old knob and tube, there was one white wire that was tracing around with all of this. You may not be able to identify it very easily. Uh, you can very carefully take a little water or cleaner and try to clean it off to see if you can get any of the white back to, to identify it. Um, but you're going to have one white and you're going to have two blacks running. Uh, and you'll, in, the easiest way to see it is in the basement. If you've got a basement or a, or a reasonable size crawl space that you can get under. Um, so, and then they go kind of follow each other to the various devices, light fixtures, receptacles, so forth, right? Over time, the insulation that surrounds that wire starts to get pretty brittle and in some cases starts to flake off. Well, you now have what's called a bare conductor and it's the bare conductor that can get you into trouble because you now no longer have anything standing between you and the current that's coming through that wire. Now, fortunately, because Americans are chronically dehydrated, we are the poorest conductors on the planet. So if you are gonna to touch a bare conductor, you're least likely to get injured than anybody else on a planet. So we've got that going for us. <laughs> do, you, do you have- <laughs> I'm not saying that seriously. A statistic <laughs> to back that up. I, I kind of do, I mean, <laughs> but no. Um, so, you know, that's, that's kind of where knob and tube is starting to get, or well, has a bad name, is that the insulation starts to break down and you start getting bare wires. Now, the person that just asked about upgrading receptacles when that knob and tube wire comes through to the box that holds that receptacle, uh, which is probably going to look, will be stuffed in the wall, but it's going to look a little bit something like this, okay? And inside of it is going to be this guy, right? And you're going to pull that out, and there's going to be some wires. And if those are old knob and tube type wires, that insulation is probably going to be very, very brittle and want to flake off. You now have created quite a potential for a short. And you'll know very quickly if you've done that when you go to flip the breaker back on and either the breaker or the fuse trips and or you're gonna get a big flash and so forth, it's gonna achieve out of you and you know you've screwed up. Um, how you correct that? In electrical 101, you're not. You're gonna stop, you're gonna pick up the phone, you're gonna call an electrician and say, help and come and help me figure this out because you, you you really don't want to start messing with that unless you really know what you're doing uh to correct that that situation right? so john stacy said that your joke about americans being dehydrated is really funny okay. and interesting i thought she was going to be offended <laughs> <laughs> thank you that is kind of true <laughs> um so that's knob and tube uh is there anything else i want to say about knob and tube oh insurance insurance companies, companies. Insurance companies. yeah and they're I'm not going to say names, yeah, yeah. but it may be something that rhymes with mm -hmm. mate marm. <laughs> who really, mate marm has a lot against knob and tube. Yeah, yeah. And, and, and knob and tube technically is a safer way of uh, distributing power in a structure than the modern Romex. Uh, unfortunately, the insurance companies are comparing you know, 80 and 100 year old knob and tube systems to, you know, modern installs of, of Romex. And they've gotten it in their heads that it needs to go. Um, knob and tube, if it gets damaged, if the, if the conductor itself, the core, the, the copper core, the wire gets damaged, uh, and it isn't a 100% break, it's let's say only, you know, you're pounding a, a nail into the wall to hang something and that nail goes in and it nicks a wire. And, but it doesn't break the wire. It just kind of, you know, cuts it half in half. All of a sudden, you have a, a real restriction right there at that point. And the electricity wants to go through it, and it can't. Um, and, but it's, it's pushing really hard to go through that. Well, when that happens, you develop heat. And this is exactly what happens when you have an electric stove. What they're doing is basically putting a big restriction, which is those coils, and pushing the electricity through them, which makes it hot, which then makes them glow and cooks your food and blah, blah, blah. This is great for cooking, not so much for your walls, okay? So now you got a hot spot in your walls. You got, you know, wooden structure, uh, lath, if it's plaster lath, well, you might get a fire, okay? 
But the same thing exists with Romex, and you'll see why in a second, and actually is a greater potential with Romex. Why the insurance companies don't have a problem with this, I can't answer that. But some of them do. There's no arguing with them. <laughs> you know, they, they're running the show when it comes to uh, homeowner insurance. So that might force you into an upgrade. Now, what consists of an upgrade? Oh, well, you know, before we go to that, anything else on number two that I should talk about, do you think? Other than it's a safe way, as long as it's in good shape, I think we've covered it. Okay. So, around about in the 50s, Romex was developed. And Romex, and again, I mentioned, and with knob and tube, you don't have this guy. You don't have that bare copper conductor, which is the grounding conductor, which goes to the mouth on a modern receptacle. Okay. So, in knob and tube, all you got is this. You've got a black wire and a white wire in a single phase circuit. Now, you might have another black wire that's that second phase. And this can be quite uh, confusing when you're trying to troubleshoot knob and tube. I have the maddest respect for the guys that installed knob and tube wiring uh, back in the day because uh, it, it does not make a lot of sense. Um, and, you know, and again, I'm not an electrician, but I've talked to a lot of electricians. It can make you crazy trying to, to track down knob and tube, all right? So anyways, they developed Romex, probably at the insistence of the electricians. Um, and it, it's a lot easier to run because you have that neutral conductor, you have the ground conductor, and then you have your power leg all in one nice little bundle, okay? Now, again, coming back to that safety aspect, let's say you got this running inside your wall and you pound a nail through it. Well, yes, you can nick the wire and create a hot spot, but more likely what you're going to do is create a dead short because your power conductor is now going to come in direct, direct contact with either your ground and or your neutral, all right? And you're going to blow a breaker. And if you have that situation in your home where you've made a modification, you've had some work done, a little carpentry, something like that, and all of a sudden you cannot keep a breaker in place, it just trips all the time, most likely, somebody's driven a nail straight through the through a Romex run. And now you get to find it, which can really, really be interesting because uh, there's nothing to tell you where it is unless you can track down what got nailed or screwed into the, you know, into the wall where. All right. So and now Romex comes in a bunch of different flavors. It's described by the number of conductors that are in it and a conductor is everything except the ground. So a conductor is the white wire, the neutral, and a conductor is the black wire. Or if you've got multiple conductors, you might have something like this, okay? Where here's your neutral, or I'm sorry, here's your ground. Here's your primary, your first leg. Here's your second leg, the red wire. And then in some cases, you get a fourth leg. So this kind of wire might get used when you're running uh, a very fancy schmancy ceiling fan that has fan and a couple of different lights that you want to be able to control from the wall with a dimmer, what have you, okay? Then you'll need those multiple conductors, all right? So again, when it comes to Romex, the number of conductors is the number of wires coming out of it, the sheath minus the ground wire. And that tends to be shown by the color of the Romex. Well, that gets into the gauge of the Romex. Okay. So the number of conductors will be listed. And of course, I've destroyed that on this package, I'm guessing. Yeah, you can't even see it. But this would be called, in this case, it would be called 12-4 because I've got four conductors not including the ground. And I happen to know because this is yellow that it's 12 gauge. So 12 refers to the gauge and then the number of conductors. Now this one's a little fancier yet because they're calling it 1222, which is just a different way of saying 124. All right. Um, this one, for instance, now this is the kind of cable that you would find going from your service entrance up to the big, funny 
uh, receptacle behind your electric stove, all right? So it needs big fat conductors to, to power up that stove, but this one would be probably six gauge, so it would be described as six three. And so this would be like for a 220 line? Exactly. Washer, or I'm sorry, your dryer. Dryer, uh, electric range, or even a gas range with electric ovens uh, is gonna have a 220 run. Uh, for the ovens, if they're you know if they're electric, all right. The other kind of cable that you might see, especially if you're in your basement or maybe your garage, is what we call metal armored conduit or MC cable. Okay, and basically it's flexible and it's designed for exposed locations. Um, so a garage, you know, you're running. Uh, power out to your garage because you know you're you're a hobbyist and you've got an air compressor out there and some big lights and things like that uh, welder grinders and so forth you would be using this kind of cable because it's out in the open the stud bays are open it's out exposed if it's overhead code says you can get away with romex you can run romex overhead but as soon as you drop down a wall and get within kind of reach so forth then you got to flip to MC and or rigid conduit, but you'll see throughout the shop. And here's an example of it kind of unpainted. All right. And then the wires are pulled through that metal conduit so that it acts basically like metal Romex. Great. Essentially what it comes down to. So that's more of a commercial. That's more commercial. You'll, you know, and uh, I mean, I've had it in the basements of my house uh, when I'm running larger pieces of equipment. It's just, it's cleaner, it's safer. Um, yeah, it's best practice, but it doesn't have to be done that way. Right? Um, now, coming to the color coding. Now, in, in this printout, it's black and white, but uh, if Ian, you could pull up uh, number seven. It's got the four different colors of uh, wire. There you go. Okay. Yeah. So to help people out, because the, the wire gauge, which is the, big, the bigness around of the wire, the, the thickness of the wire, is really sometimes difficult to tell unless you play with this stuff all the time. Now, it's pretty obvious that this is six. Okay. So, well, I say it's obvious. I know it's six. There's six, there's eight, there's 10. And by the way, as the gauge number goes up, the wire size comes down because we're trying to be helpful. Right. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Cause that makes sense. <laughs> it makes sense. So, um, the typical residential wire gauges, again, for big loads, it's going to be sixes, maybe an eight, but mostly six for the big loads, the ranges, the dryers, AC units, things like that. It's central air, and I'm talking not your window air conditioners. Everything else is probably going to be 12 gauge. 14 gauge was popular, and I think there's some some building departments that really kind of. I I don't think they can ban it because it's it's still within the national code, but they really ask you not to use it. Used to be everything came in that white sheath. Where'd that go? right? Like you see at the top of the page there. But they've since gone to color coding the sheaths to indicate the gauge of the wire, the thickness of the wire. So white's going to be 14 gauge. Yellow is going to be 12 gauge. 10 gauge is going to be orange. And then you get into your underground cables, your outdoor cables, um, the stuff you can bury. And that's the two lower examples down there are the stuff that you can use outside. I'm not going to talk about that here tonight. We just don't have the time to go into to exterior um, uh, electrical. And, it, and it, it has its own difficulties and, and um, procedures and codes and so forth. So we're just going to skip that here tonight, if you don't, if you don't mind. So what you're going to see inside the envelope of your house is going to be white, yellow, and or the, the uh, orange uh, cable in Romex. That does not apply to knob and tube. Knob and tube used to be black with the white. And sometimes it's really hard to tell, especially when you've got 80 plus years on that wire. All right. 
Uh, what's next? Maybe switches? Yeah, Can I think so. Any other question? Hey, uh, Ian, any questions on the, the cabling before I move off? Uh, no questions. Okay. So I have some breakers here that, that are not in the panel. And I just pulled them out so that you can get an idea of what these things look like. Unfortunately, I don't have any single phase breakers out of the box right now. These are double or, or uh, 220, or, yeah, 220 breakers. So each of them is a 110. Exactly. And the amperage, okay, again, volts and amperage, 110 volts or 120 volts, but however you want to describe it, 50 amps each. Now, this would be appropriate to use with this number six cable, and the black and the red would go here. Okay, and you'll notice that on that breaker, there's a little bridge so that they operate together. Okay, and that's essential when you're turning that device on and off is to have that bridge. Okay, if you don't have that bridge, you could technically take two 50 amp breakers, park them side by side, and get the same thing done. But you're liable to damage your device when you flip those breakers on and off because you're never going to get it quite timed right. All right. So don't cheat. Get the appropriate breaker. All right. Now, the amount of amperage that you're sending down the line is also going to drive what receptacle it can go to if you're, if you're powering up a receptacle. So on a single phase, one leg, whether it's two wire, or the two prong, or whether it's a three prong, and I'm and I apologize, I don't have a white one, so it's maybe difficult to see that that third one in the middle there. All right. Those devices have a rating; they can only handle so much amperage. So, if in your box, in your breaker box, so let's see, I have sixty, I've got twenties, I got thirties, so forth. Well, I can't send fifty amps to a little 15 amp receptacle. And I know this is 15 amps because I got a little slot and a big slot in line like that Whoa, with a hole. See, you see the difference little. Mm -hmm. Right, and I'll get into the difference there in a second. All right, so that's 15 amps. Now you can read it on the back if you like. Where is it saying that? You know, it's probably very small, sometimes hard to see. I'm going to right. see. But it's printed on there. It has to be by law. Okay. Okay. So you can't read that. It's very you really can't. Hard to read. Can't read it. But I know. You now know that it's 15 amps because it's two vertical with one in the middle. Okay. So this one also has. Exactly. So that would have what rating? This would be 15. Exactly. Now. So on this one, it says it on the front. Okay. In the middle part, and then it also says 125 volts. Exactly. All right. Now, you compare it to this one, what's the difference? We've got on the, on the big slot, we've got a little thing in the middle. Well, I know, and now you know, that means that this receptacle is rated for 20 amps. Now, do all GFCI, mm -mm. so that you have to really pay attention to that little T, that little tick mark. Correct. To know, and mm -hmm. that also probably says it somewhere on, the on there. Yep. And all that verbiage back there that my eyes cannot quite sort out. Okay. <laughs> okay. Now it gets even sillier. And again, this is where, where Google is your friend. Okay. Cause you can bring all of this up in a nice chart and so forth. But if we come back over here, you've got a big honk in a receptacle like this. All right. Now this is for a 220 line, which actually comes up to this 100 amp breaker. Okay, but it's the same, it's kind of the same configuration, but it's huge. So we know that this thing can handle 100 amps, all right? Now you'll find other configurations where that slot might be something, those slots might be pointed like this. Yeah, like your washer or dryer. Exactly. The orientation of those slots tells mm -hmm. you their amperage rating on what I they can- I have never known that. What they can carry. Ever. Yeah. Okay, huh. and that's important, but you can't just, Take your dryer, not that you, well, maybe you could, maybe people have laundry rooms on their, you know, in their kitchens now. Take that dryer 
and plug it in where your stove used to be, and so forth. You might get away with it, but you'll have to change the plug and you may trip or break it. Okay. So that's how that all shakes out for receptacles. GFCIs, ground fault circuit interrupter. There's now AFCIs, which is a more modern version of this, which is arc fault uh, circuit interrupter. All right. And these are little nanny, I call them nanny receptacles because they are really designed to make sure that whatever you plug into them is in good shape, all right? And it measures that the amount of current going in more or less equals, with a, with a, it has a tolerance, the amount of current coming out. And if it doesn't add up, meet its requirements, it'll trip, okay? And this, we all know this one. Yes, all this know this one. my hair dryer. Okay. Your hair dryer. <laughs> these are now, these are required in anything that has a wet location in it. So bathrooms, kitchens, laundry areas, and anything exterior. Arc fault, and again, don't quote me on this, but arc fault, I think, is now required throughout the rest of the, the house and the living spaces, I believe. Okay? So you have these, and the way these are often put in is you will have a circuit coming into the kitchen. Let's take the kitchen for the example. It'll come into this GFCI. You'll notice on the back, this is a little bit like tearing the tag off of a mattress. I could go to jail for this. Thank you have pictures, I think. So, yeah. <laughs> but you've got several different yeah. connections on the back of this GFCI, which allows you to use this GFCI to then make a bunch of other receticles GFCI protected because you start daisy chaining them. Yes, off and of I this. think that's fairly common in kitchens mm -hmm. and bathrooms. If you it have multiple, is. you know, not in ours because who has multiple plugs in their bathroom? Exactly. Yeah. But we, have, we have one, and everything is hung on it. Yeah. Right. Exactly. But in the kitchens, um, definitely that is something that does happen, which is really cool. Yeah. Yeah. Now the other way around that, and again, best practice, but certainly more expensive up front, is a GFCI breaker which you then install in your panel. So let's say you're remodeling your kitchen and it's gutted and the contractor is tearing everything out and it's gonna give you all new receptacles and so forth. This is the way to go because then this makes it a lot more flexible for the contractor and, and also for you in terms of uh, receptacle replace, placement and so forth. This is in the basement. If it trips, you know where to go. It's here, it's, it's just a lot easier. And these tend to be a little more robust than these. These wear out. Typically five to ten years, depending on how they're beat on, and you're gonna they, they just finally give it up. And you can't, you'll try to reset it and just won't reset, even with nothing on it, it won't reset. And it's time to replace it. Okay. So that's GFCI receptacles. Hey Ian, do you have any questions? Yes, we do. Um so uh, someone has asked, I have knob and tube wiring. I'm interested in getting more outlets added throughout the house, in particular outside. Do I need to be concerned about adding outlets because of the knob and tube? Uh, I, will my chances of blowing fuses increase? Yeah, it would. Um, and it's not necessarily going to be the knob and tube that's the issue, because I'll bet you that knob and tube runs back to a very small uh, service entrance and or breaker panel. Um, with maybe a hundred amp service. Uh, there's some breaker panels that have 60 amp service. Um, I'm guessing that's probably gonna be more the issue than the actual knob and tube. You're gonna find it probably impossible, almost impossible to get an electrician to tap in to knob and tube um, and run a knob and tube circuit to an exterior uh, receptacle. They're going to want to junction box it and run Romex out there. And yeah, I, I would not be surprised if the news is not real good for you uh, in terms of cost. It's probably going to require some, some upgrades, even if it's not complete, a partial upgrade uh, for, that, for that circuit. And, you know, that makes me take back my statement or at least back, it, back off of it a little bit about if you're if you're buying a house and you go in the basement and you see multiple panels, uh, one excuse for that could be what 
uh, this, this one uh, participant is, is asking about, and that is, I just need to add some exterior power or something like that. That might be an excuse to put a small panel right next to the old panel and, and drive those exterior uh, receptacles and lighting off of that. So I'll back that up a little bit. Great. Thanks, John. Uh, we have two more, if I may. Uh, mm -hmm. Any suggestions on how to find a good electrician to do upgrades and what are some specific questions to ask them? Oof. Well, uh, for the contractor part, you can yeah. contact Lakewood Alive. Yep. We're happy to connect you to electricians. So to speak. <clears throat> So, um, and, uh, you know, we have several names that, you know, we have close, not close relationships, that's not the right word, but we know their work and we know that they're good contractors. So you can always email me, Allison, um, or give me a call, happy to help with that. And just a kind of a rule of thumb, and, and it's a little tongue in cheek, is if the electrician is available within a week, they're probably a lousy electrician. Um, good electricians are tied up like a good contractor. They're going to be tied up. It'll be very rare that they can just, you know, show up at a day's notice and so forth. Some of them have emergency service, but it, you're going to pay for that. And, and they will let you know that up, that up front. Um, and also, frankly, if you have family and friends, you know, people who are handy themselves, so forth, you know, have a feeling they know what they're, what they're on about. When it comes to households, ask them for their electrician. Um, that's you know better than the in my mind the Angie's lists and some of these other uh, subscription uh, listings uh, for for um, contractors. Great, thank you. And then the final one: uh, How many outlets uh, would you recommend having per room? Old homes seem to have uh, one or two. New homes seem to have an outlet every couple of feet. Exactly. Question. Yeah. Well, code has changed over the years. Um, and again, I've been away from it long enough now that I'm going to say this with a little bit of reservation, but when I was playing with it last, uh, every wall that's longer than six feet has to have an outlet and there should be an outlet every six feet, uh, in new construction. And I think I got that right. Um, and the number of outlets has nothing to do with the size of the breaker that you have to install a panel in, in the, into the panel. So the number of outlets is, you know, kind of the lower cost end of the project and add as many as you can, can tolerate because they're never in the right place. <laughs> We've all just learned that over time. And something that people should probably know, if, an elect if um, electricians are cutting holes in walls, they are not fixing any, anything. So it's not going to be finished. They're literally just going to cut a hole in the wall or if they're fishing line or running line, any work that they do on your drywall or your plaster and lath, you will have to bring in someone else to fix. That's true. And the only caveat to that is unless you specify otherwise, when you're you know, looking for a contractor, you, you say, I want you to handle uh, repairing the walls. Um, some of them may step up to that and some of them might say no. Um, electricians, Probably not, but they will know somebody uh, and should be able to give you some referrals. I, on the other hand, when I was, you know, adding circuits and things like that, I typically finished my own work. So it can go, it can go both ways. That is all. all right. Thank you. Great. Okay. Thank you. All right. So let's see. We've, uh, oh, switches. Hmm. So, so we've talked about receptacles. Now there's switches, and switches can be used to operate not only light fixtures, but sometimes receptacles, okay? So I think we've all been in somebody's home where the light switch operates a little floor lamp, all right? And the way they get that done is that the switch is controlling power to either the entire receptacle or you have the ability to split the receptacle. All right. Stop it. Yep. So these receptacles are called duplexes. There's two of them, but just instead of calling them a receptacle, they call them a duplex because you can split it up. And that's why you typically have four lugs on the back of any receptacle. All right. Now, since the beginning of time, receptacles and switches 
have used silver and brass or gold to indicate which conductor goes onto it. So the silver conductor is kind of white looking. So that always gets the neutral, All right? The gold conductor gets the power leg, whether it's black or in the case of multi-conductor, red, so forth, All right? If you're just gonna power up, and the green gets the, uh, gets the ground conductor in Romex uh, uh, situations, All right? So let's say you wanna split this. Well, I'd have to bring in two wires, which is a perfect application for that 1222 wire I was talking about. Using the neutral wire on just one silver and using the two of those other guys to power up these two lugs. And you attach them to both and then take a pair of snips and snip that little bridge in between. Now this receptacle is split. So if this one conductor is coming through a switch, it is now operated on and off by that switch, leaving the other half of that receptacle constantly powered. So if you've got televisions or, you know, whatever you want to run that you don't want that, that power switched. This is mind blowing right now. You've not, you've not, you, uh, I'm, I'm schooling Allison. I am. I mean, because how many times do you turn off the switch and like nothing works? Mm, exactly. Right. And so that's annoying. Yep. yep. I didn't know that you could split them. Okay. I'm, I mean, I always learn something. I'm not going to lie, <laughs> but I just learned something mind blown. All right. Cool. Cool. So switches come in more or less three flavors, right? You've got what we call, and they call them poles. And, um, I understand why it doesn't make any difference, but it's called pole. The basic switch is the single pole switch, right? And you have a wire coming in and you have a wire coming out and you have a ground lug, okay? For that copper wire, that bare copper wire. Now switches are supposed to be only attached to the power leads, black or the red, okay? You don't run neutral wires through switches. This sometimes gets forgotten in old knob and tube applications. And it can be rather quite exciting when somebody has switched what they call switched neutral, a light fixture. Instead of switching power, they've switched it neutral, okay? It's a cheat for a three-way switch so that you can run the same lamp, the same white fixture off of two different switches on each side of the room, okay? It's not the way to do it, but it's a cheat and it gets done. So you'll go and kill the power in the basement thinking you've unpowered mm. your switch to that fixture. They want a ceiling fan. You go up there, you touch that power lead, and all of a sudden, fortunately, I'm chronically dehydrated, <laughs> okay? So, so single pole switch, that's flavor number one, most common on, off, that's as good as it gets, all right? Flavor number two is ever so irritating three-way switch. And we all know what this is. And this is the proper way to run one fixture from two switches in a room. Okay, you got one on each end of the, let's look at a dining room or a living room. You put that down, the other one goes up, okay? You can tell because you're gonna have two brass legs, two brass lugs, I, sh I should say, and then two other colored lugs. Okay, the brass lugs, okay, are power in and out. And oh, we've got a diagram for this. Hang on. Uh, slide number nine, Ian, if you would, please. All right, there you go. So that's how a three-way switch operates. It's a little bit like a train yard. Now, that might look a little confusing right now, but if you download this or, or take an image of that and so forth and study it and look at it, you'll see what's going on. Basically, when one switch is operating, it's sending power to the other switch, and if it's in the on position, will then send power up to the light, okay? 
If it's not, then the light goes out. Flip one of the other switches the other way, and the light comes on. And it just sits there and goes back and forth, okay? If you're in an old house and, you, and you've got a three-way switch that goes bad and you open up that, pull that plate and pull that switch out, you're like, what the? Because everything's a black wire at, by, by this time, okay? Either uh, paint pens, uh, they make electrical tape in multicolors. Do something. When you pull that switch out, you mark what lead goes to what lug on the old switch. You don't do that. I'm sorry about your luck, but your chances of getting that thing up and running again as an amateur are pretty slim. Okay. Okay. So that's the three-way switch. Now it gets worse because, oh, I'm holding it. I'm sorry. Well, I'm sorry. I lied. This is now the four-way switch. So you can now then insert a switch between the two outside switches. So let's say you have three doorways into this room. You can now put a switch at all three doorways and run one uh, uh, light receptacle or fixture, okay? I didn't provide the diagram for that. These are very, very rare. If you have this situation, get on the phone, get an electrician, okay? Dimmers, timers, motion detectors, so forth, they're all available. So for bathrooms, this has become very common to operate uh, exhaust fans. So that you, when you walk into the room, the fan starts. When you walk out of the room, it runs for a period of time to clear the steam, so forth, from your shower without you having to worry about coming back in and, and, and shutting it off. All right? Dimmers on off with a little dimmer control. Okay. And again, these are available in either single pole or the three-way. Mm -hmm. So I'm going to ask you a question, and you may not know the answer. Mm -hmm. well, certainly possible. <laughs> well, I don't know anything about them because I'm not very technologically advanced. But smart switches, so, so like no, Alexa. Sorry. Nope, I have no idea. I honestly, I don't know. I think you install them like a normal switch, and then it has like some technology involved. So I'm Smarter sorry, than me. Smarter than me. we don't have the answers to that. Yeah. Uh, but um, I think they're fairly easy to install. So yeah. I just, that'll be a class in the future. I'm, I'm yeah, I'm old school. We I'm just frightened about my house. We actually tried to get a workshop scheduled on this topic, um, but weren't able to get the folks because of the pandemic. So yeah. probably 2022, we'll do smart house a smart house workshop. Yeah. yeah. Sorry. Yeah, I don't know either. So I okay. still use a paper calendar. <laughs> oh, what else do we need to talk about? So this is a great time. We're getting ready to kind of finish up our workshop. Um, if there are any additional questions, now is the time. We'd love to answer them. I'm just going to uh, spend just a minute on testers. Yes, let's please do, because okay. for safety purposes, right. um, very important. So... And again, I think if there's any homework that I'd like uh, to send you home with uh, would be to map your electrical, okay? And the way you do that is you take a device. It can be as simple as just a little uh, uh, handheld uh, floor lamp, just a small one, um, or they make fancy smancy detectors, which I'll show you in a second, um, or little things like this. And again, what you're trying to do is figure out what each breaker and or fuse, what it's feeding power to, okay? Much easier with two people, unless you're really looking for a workout because it's a lot of running around and so forth. But you're gonna, on a note page, you're gonna, your, your breaker panels, for instance, well, even your fuse panels are numbered, okay? And on the left, you have the odd numbers, one, three, five, seven, corresponding. And on the right, you're gonna have the even numbers. Now, something else I'm gonna point out right now, I talked about those two phases, those two power legs. The odd numbers are one power leg and the even numbers are the other power leg. So you can go back and forth, okay? Um, 
And when you're mapping it out, you're gonna have the breaker on, all of the others off. And then you're gonna find out what's still up and running, all right? And you're gonna write that down. And then in an older house, which only has instead of an array of, you know, what, 40 breakers, you're gonna have six. Well, it's not gonna just be air compressor. It's gonna look more like this one, where it says microwave, coffee pot, hall light, bath, GC, GFCI, blah, 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 blah. So whether that'll all fit there or whether you're better off making a little, you know, sheet that's got a clear protector and keeping that, you know, close by, um, you decide whatever's easiest. But knowing what breaker does what is just so valuable uh, when it comes to uh, repairs, troubleshooting, and so forth. So mm -hmm. what you haven't brought up is the game. You said it was going to be well, a game. It is a game. Um, well, it's a game in, in, in that. No, maybe it really isn't a game. It, it, it could just Let's be a lot of fun. Let's not try to make it I know, fun. I know. It's, it's just, it could be a lot of fun shouting up and down, on, off, you know. Eh, you could yeah. play a drinking maybe game I'm, or something yeah, maybe with I'm a it. Nerd. <laughs> I think you want to come? I mean, mine is already mapped, but you can come over and there you go. test mine exactly. out. Exactly. Exactly. So the most basic of testers is going to be something like this, right? It's got two little leads, a red and a black. Now, why they do red and black, I'm not sure. Um, because the black one is the power, and the red one would be what color? Should be what color? White, maybe? Yeah, it's not. Um, but you come over here. Oh, the other thing I should point out. The reason these slots are different sizes, did I cover this? You did. Okay, neutral versus power? You talked about the different amps. Ah, well, there's even more. So the long slot is always the neutral. Didn't know that. Yep, and a lot of your devices are, are polarity specific. So in other words, it depends, it's, it's important right. which one it is. So be consistent. So in this case, put that in there, put that in there. I got nothing. But if I put the breaker on, there we go. All right. Now, this is the power leg. I come up here to the neutral. That should come on, which it does. I do it the other way around. I'm in my neutral, and I come up to my ground. Oh, make a liar out of me. Oh, that's because it's 220. See? It's because it's 220. Sorry, let's try this one. Okay, so we gotta go this backwards. Okay. Da -da. Now this is the neutral. I cut, so the power's still engaged. I come up here to the ground. Yep, still got, still got a light. Come back, take the power one away and go up to the ground. I got nothing. All right, so that's the most basic of testers. They make the kind that you can plug in and has three prongs. And that's great if you got three prong alphas. Right. If you don't, then you are reduced to something like this. Which looks like that one. Uh, which looks like this, exactly. Or this. And these are what I used to use when I was trying to, you know, track down circuits and so forth. So this little guy, it's not a, the cheapest thing in the world, but oh, does it, especially for if you're solo. Saves you a lot of time. You go to your receptacle, you plug it in, or if I'm dealing with a light fixture, I plug it in here and then screw it into the light fixture. Go like so. All right. Got my little device here. And what this thing is doing, this thing's emitting a single a signal back down the line. And I don't know if you can hear, but it's kind of beeping and make a noise and kind of beep it. And what you're waiting for is that signal to become the strongest. And that is probably your breaker. Ah, now that's saying 16. Now we verify that by turning 16 off and 16 has gone silent, it's no longer beeping. So we know that breaker 16 is driving this receptacle. I know what I'm putting on my Christmas there list. There you go. I'm telling you, this thing is brilliant. So what I've done in my shop, you notice that when you've been looking here, these numbers, these numbers correspond 
to the breaker. Be like John, people. Be exactly. like John, because this is very organized. Also, if you see his fan, he gives us directions of which, which way it should summer. go for the summer and <laughs> exactly. winter. Exactly. So very organized, John. Yeah. <laughs> so that's amazing. Now, um, so everyone should be putting a circuit tester on their Christmas list. Of some sort. Yes, it could be that real fancy one, or it could just be a simple one, but it's good to have for safety and protection. And then also, if you are having trouble with your outlets, it'll let you know if it's working or exactly not. Exactly right. Exactly right. Great. Uh, Ian, any other questions? The only question that we had was um, a little bit earlier on, and I think she may have dropped off, but I still want to at least ask. One person said they get confused sometimes with the new, um, the new bulbs by the watts and the new way of saying how bright the how bright the light on uh, the bulb is so can you explain that john yeah yeah i think maybe what they were referring to uh may not be so much brightness but color temperature so uh in in, in residential lighting and even in in shop lighting and, and this shop is a good example actually uh color is 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 sometimes expressed in temperature so a soft white, a warm, or maybe a soft or warm white uh, bulb is probably around 3,000 degrees Kelvin, okay? And that'll be expressed as 3,000 K. A, you start go, moving up in brightness to daylight, uh, outdoor, so forth, those things can move up to 5,000 K. So if you look at my shop lighting, for instance, the lights, the, the fluorescent lights on the right, I know that those are 4,000 K tubes, okay? The LED high bays next to them on the left, I know that those are 5,000. And you okay. wonder why I was wearing sunglasses when I came in exactly here. Exactly right. It's very bright. I know you can see that, yep. but it's, it's, it's a very great work area. It, exactly. Exactly, especially when you know you're you're a man of a certain age and and your eyesight is beginning to fail. <laughs> so so that, I think that's what she's probably referring to in terms of temperature. Um, and again, it, it's either expressed as as a temperature, or and again, and especially in the big boxes and so forth, there'll be a chart that says, okay, three thousand K uh, refers to uh, warm white, and then you've got. Uh, What's the next one up? I think is daylight. I think, um, and then uh, I've got that wrong, but it's it's something like that. So the higher the number, the brighter the light. You'll see this on the road today with most of your newer cars having LED lights that run anywhere from mm, five thousand to eight thousand K, and those are really bright, um, and, you, and you'll you know almost uh, almost blue. Uh, they're that bright, so. I hope that answers the question. Well, that was, a, I didn't realize there was a number associated, but again, I don't buy a lot of light bulbs, right. but um, I like lamp light. My husband loves bright overhead, mm -hmm. bright, bright, bright. So we run around chasing after each other, either turning <laughs> off lights or turning on lights. Um, it looks like you may have one last question. Yes, we just got it in. Uh, I was about to say no further questions. So uh, thanks, Dave. Uh, the question is, uh, please explain the names of switches again, uh, questions around uh, single pole versus three-way, et cetera. And then is single pole also called one-way? Mm -hmm. And to add on, is a three-way also called three-pole? End of question. No, no, the pole, the, 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 they make some two-pole switches. I really don't want to get into that because it's a, it's a specialty application. But basically, a single pole switch means you've got power coming in one and going out the other right it's it's operating on and off one circuit um and then from there you get the three-way and if you were to pull up that diagram you could take that one circuit and send it one way or the other and that then becomes a three-way i'm not gonna say that this you know is all logical once you've played with it long enough you begin to get a sense of it and and, and you'll just know it um but yeah, there's, there's, there's the one-way switch, and then the next step is the three-way switch, and then the next step is the four-way switch. Did that do it? Dave, do you have any other further questions on that? Uh, and if you do, please feel free to submit them, or we can follow up with you 
Oh, looks like something came up. Yeah, so let's get to that. Uh, Dave actually said uh, no. So I think <laughs> okay. we are good to go. Thanks, Dave. Uh, no right. further questions at this time. Thanks, Dave. And right. hi to Sandy, if it's the same Dave. Um, so, all right. Well, John, this has been amazing. Thank you so much. And uh, we are so lucky next week, next Thursday, we have another workshop. And I won't be here, and neither will Ian. So uh, we have oh, John, Brian is, and, John and Brian. Yeah, we're leaving. Like, the kids are going to be in charge. Oh, boy, uh, oh boy. Brian Evans and John Turner will be doing a workshop for us next week. Um, I will, I'll be getting an award, which, uh, is kind of exciting or, <laughs> um, so I will not be here and I will miss all of you, but you'll be in good hands. Uh, so next week, uh, next Thursday, we have our insulation workshop. And then on the 21st, we're going to be doing plumbing 101. So I hope you'll join us. Where I'll uh, use electrical analogies to explain plumbing. Exactly. We're going to have a more fun, even more fun talking jargon and things. Right. So again, uh, thank you all for joining us tonight. Thank you, Ian, for helping uh, us uh, from, from uh, Grand Central over there. And um, I don't think we have any other questions. I don't want to miss anything. Uh, no, we are good to go. Thanks, Allison. Okay, great. Well, thank you all so very, very much for attending. Thank you, John. See you next week for those that are coming around for the installation. Yes, I hope you'll join us. Make sure to sign up. Uh, and then the plumbing one will be posted uh, probably tomorrow on uh, Facebook for signing up. So thank you all so much. I hope you enjoy the rest of your evening. Take care. Bye.